type of thing. Now, this is, uh, with this method using marginal cost, you only need one slide. That's it. You don't need like a lot of it. Uh, so what we did in the past was, uh, in, the, uh, in the last class was we, you would do all the calculation, and then you look at the highest profit. Everybody remember that? And then you look across and find what is the level of output, and that is the answer. Now remember, the again, summarizing the answers varies from, uh, well, let me say just uh, in general if you remember anything, because it's good to review it very quickly. Okay, so if, uh, if your total revenue goes up, so again, profit, write this down if you missed the last class, is total revenue minus total cost. And your total cost consists of two types of cost, tell me. Fixed. fixed and variable cost. Now, fixed cost is something that uh, you have to pay regardless. For example, you have to rent a machine and it costs how much per day, and that's the same. If you're not producing anything, you still have to pay. Well, it's just like the utility bill, right? You get your monthly bill, you know. Uh, that's what you pay. It's a fixed amount, and you're not going to say, well, because I close on Sunday and Saturday, you should deduct this two-day. No. You know, that's a fixed cost. It doesn't matter how many uh, units you're producing. If you're running a restaurant on a football day, a, uh, many people who come to your store. So, of course, you know, you're going to cook more meal, and your total labor cost will go up. However, your fixed cost is the same. Whereas it's uh, 10, uh, 100 customers coming through your restaurant to eat or few customers on a rainy day, you're going to pay the utility bill regardless of the numbers. So that's your fixed cost. Now, variable cost in this example we gave is the number of workers you hire. Okay, and that's your total variable cost, which is this column right here, total labor cost, because that goes up when you hire more workers. Okay, so you add your fixed cost to get your total cost, and then your profit last column is derived. As a reminder from last class, you take total revenue minus total cost throughout every row to derive at that last row. And then what you do is you pick the highest number, which is 30, right? And then we look across and say, aha, uh -huh, 400 is the answer. Now, this is a quicker way to do it if you understand it. If you don't understand it, don't worry. Do it the old-fashioned way, which is a more tedious way, but you will get it right. Total revenue minus total cost. The quicker way is to use marginal <coughs> cost. And this is what I'm going to show you. The production rule says that B must be greater than or equal to marginal cost. So in other words, we have to calculate marginal cost. Do we know the price? Yes, that price is given to you as $35 per 100 uh, unit of output. So we know that one. So the next thing we need to do is you need to calculate the marginal cost. So if you use this approach, you have to show me all your marginal cost. Okay, now anybody remember from chapter one? Very first class, we talked about it. What is the marginal cost of the first unit? It would be? Total cost of producing one unit. Minus total cost zero. Total cost of when you're not producing. Mm -hmm. Marginal cost of the second unit, notice I use the word second, will be the total cost of two units, not second but two, mm -hmm. minus, minus total unit. cost of one, one unit. unit. Very good. Using that formula, that's how we get 10, because 50 minus 40 is 10, 60 minus 50 is 10, 80 minus 60 is 20, 110, and, and so on and so forth. We get that. Everybody got that part? Do you see a trend in marginal cost as you produce more? What? Do you see a pattern? You know what is patterns, right? It goes up. Yeah, it goes up. As you produce more, all this number goes up. Except for the first one, but you know. Uh, so if you look at your diagram on page 138, it looks like that. Okay, so produce more units, uh, this is a number of bottles, and then keep going up. Okay, the reason that I want to show you that graph, actually, that's when I had my TA do it, it's because I want to show you that 
Remember earlier in the other chapter, we say this is the yin curve, downward sloping, this is your supply curve, down, upward sloping. Mm -hmm. I also say that when you do not have any externality, nothing whatsoever, whatever you produce is reflected in the supply curve, then your supply curve is also your marginal. Okay, I'll give you the other. You know, that that uh, demand curve would be your marginal benefit curve. So this would be your very good. Now you got it. And that's what it is. It looks like a supply curve, and that is your perfect competitive firm. Individual supply curve is your marginal cost curve. Okay. So now you got all that. So how do we solve the problem using this method? And we're gonna apply this rule. P is greater than or equal to the MC. So do it slowly. You ask yourself, is it okay, okay for the first one? Price is $35, is it greater than MC? Yes. Mm -hmm. Price is 35, MC is 10, so it is greater. Second one okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> next one okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next one okay? Mm -hmm. What about next one? No. No. So you start right there. Okay, you start right between 30 and 40 because this is 35. And then what you do is uh, be very careful. This is when sometimes students get it wrong. So then you go back, you calculate. Your answer should be the same answer you got before, which is 400 in this case. So you get the closest one. Uh, is everybody okay with that? So this is 10. This is the first, this is the second, third, fourth. And this is the fifth one. So one, two, three, four, five. So it is 400. So now a lot of times students got that part, but then they got mixed up. They either picked the wrong one, 300 or 500. It should be the original number, which I think it was 400. Let's go back to our graph. Okay, this is the original case. Remember using the old fashioned way, uh, we got that. 400 was the answer. So you should get the same answer. Now, if you want, of course, uh, that kind of like give you a hint, you know. If you use it by, if you use a marginal cost method, you've got the answer. You could go back and use the other method, throw the revenue minus, throw the cost. If you get the same answer, then you know for sure. That got to be a correct answer. You wouldn't have to copy from someone else to get that answer, because you know in your heart that's the correct answer. So everybody okay with that? Okay, very good. That's so, a little bit confusing. About what? Because Go um, ahead. if you picked 400, when you look at 40, it's not greater than, or the, it's not greater well, than. Well, it's supposed to be higher than that. So <laughs> this doesn't show very well. So 50 minus 40. So you see, because this one is uh, it's supposed to be in between here. 50 minus 40, you have a 10. This one's supposed to go up a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, see that one's supposed to be up, so that's the problem. Okay. 60 minus 50 is 10, and then 80 minus 20, you got it there. And then 10 minus 8, you got 30. And then 50 minus 10, you got 40. And what, what you do is you're supposed to pick, see this 40 is supposed to be in between this two number, and then you pick this one, okay. not the one before. Okay. okay, because remember the definition is, so this will be MC4 equal to TC4 minus TC3. So that will be your, uh, yeah, so that's how you get that. Okay, um, so that's one way to do it. And now we're getting to the gist of this perfect competition. Anybody remember what the, Perfectly uh, competitive from demand curve looks like? Straight, straight line. line. Straight line, okay. How straight? Horizontal. Horizontal is good because a straight line could be a vertical line, could be a straight line, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. It is horizontal. Yeah, don't forget that this is a very important one. If you don't get this, almost like 10 classes come up. Any particular demand curve or PC. PC stands for perfect competition, not personal computer. You say that because you missed the class. So the end comes right here, marginal revenue, which is also your price. And they're considered a price taker. So I put a P bar there, it means price is fixed. And at this price, let's say $20, you could uh, 
you could uh, consumer to ask for as many units as possible. <coughs> so remember that this is individual demand curve. It's not a supply curve. Now, supply curve is your marginal cost. So I'm going to put it in here. And it looks like a fishing hook. So I have nickname for all this line, you know. So that's what I call a fishing hook. And that's your marginal cost for an individual demand curve. Now, we don't pay so much attention to why it is a hook because textbook does not emphasize it. But if you take out a, well, same cause without a professor or some other textbook will emphasize and explain why it is dropping before it goes up. Since your textbook does not mention it, we won't have to deal with it. So I want you to pay attention where the two lines are crossing. If you drop it down here, I'm going to call this Q star. Very important. This is called profit maximizing quantity. Please take that. So what that means is at that point there, your P is equal to MC. And this is your profit maximizing criterion right there. And this is a good one to write down. Um, and, and this is for all market structure. Whether you look at perfect competition, uh, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, or even uh, later on monopoly, this is always going to be profit maximizing criterion. It's always marginal revenue and marginal cost. Always, always. However, because in the case of PC, Again, PC means a perfect competition. We already know that, look over here. Your demand curve is your price line, it's also your marginal revenue. So you could easily substitute that marginal revenue with C equals to MC. Can't stop. I'm going to keep asking you that question until you get it, because that is so important. Where's the profit maximizing criterion? Where the two lines crossing price is equal to MC. You drop it down, and that's your profit maximizing quantity. So this is what this is saying here. OK, uh, how do you produce? When do you know when is the best point to produce? And I think you can't know the answer already. The answer is when you have the highest profit. In the base case that we look at, that was 400. And then in another case, it was 500 after you change the various uh, scenario there, and then in another case, it was 300. So, but the moral we learn, the, the main lesson we learned from last class was that uh, if the uh, if fixed costs change, your level of production will not change. You will keep producing at 400 bottles, that is. But if your marginal cost or your variable cost, which is kind of like your variable, excuse me, which is kind of like your marginal cost. Remember we changed that, we say the labor cost, instead of $10 per hour, now we've raised it to $12 per hour. Okay, if that's the case, then you typically would have uh, higher variable cost. So basically what happened is you expect your level of production to change. What way, up or down? That requires a little bit of thinking. What do you think? If your total variable cost is higher, your total cost is going to be higher. All things being equal, it costs you more to produce, so therefore you will produce less. So that's the case of your chapter three. You didn't know until I point out. See, your supply curve in chapter three, you say, oh yeah, where, where are all the determinants of supply curve? You say, if the cost of raw material, if the cost of production, that is labor and all that goes up, then it should shift to the left. It makes you to produce less in your homework that you've done. Okay, I see that you're using a PC, which you might sitting on the first row next class if you want to use a PC in class. Okay, thank you very much. I think that was mentioned in the first day. Um, Okay, right here, for a perfectly competitive firm, your marginal revenue is equal to price. So that's your right here. That's the same thing. 
okay? Except a lot of the time we express it this way, P goes to MC, because that's a little bit easier to understand. So next we say, uh, we already know that uh, perfect competitive firm is a price taker. It does not have any market power, unlike monopoly. Later on when we look at monopoly, that is all the assumptions we look at for perfect competition, we're gonna relax them one by one. Anybody, anybody remember what were some of the assumptions we look at for perfect competitive firm? I'll give you a few hints here. You're welcome to look back. And this is very important. I will, we will ask you that on the test. This is so important. Anybody remember that? What are some of the features? Number one, price taker. Number two? Yeah. Um. I would ask you this question on the day of the test to refresh your memory. What else? What do they say about consumers? Are they smart or dumb? We use the word, uh, they are they very are well informed, okay? And do you have a lot of buyers, uh, do you have a lot of sellers, or just one or two? Oh, that's a very obvious one. You have lots and lots of them, that's why you cannot influence the price, because you're just like, remember my expression? You're like a small drop of water in the big bucket of water. You're a small player in the big industry. So you have no market power to influence the price. This is a very important. What else did we say about resources? Look it up. Tell me. Productive resources are mobile. They are mobile, yeah. You can move it around easily. You could close down today and just exit the market, or you could get into it easily. This is very important. So I'm going to repeat it again. That was in your PowerPoint earlier. Uh, so these are called the features of the perfect competition. Um, I definitely will ask that question on the test because it, it is so important. Okay, let's look at the disequilibrium here. Uh, the, see these two lines here? What that's saying is if your price is above MC, so right here, let's say this number is 500. So if the price is above MC, here's your price, here's your MC, so it will be somewhere around here. Say, how about 200? So at this point here, your price is, uh, everybody see that? At 200, your price is up here, but your MC is down here. So this is the case where P equals to MC. So if you're not in the equilibrium, that's a hint to you that you're not producing enough. You're not producing at a point of profit maximizing. So that gives you a hint that if your price is greater than MC, you should push yourself a little bit more. What does that mean? Produce more, come on. Come on, you can do more. Because the price is above MC, so you can do a little bit more until you get to this point where you go to MC. And that's a profit maximizing quantity. So that's something that uh, criterion for you when you do a business in the future. Now what about the other extreme right here? The other extreme will be like say uh, 800 or 700. How about at this point 700? So call this point B R A and this point B here. So at 700, what happened here is your your price is now below MC. Everybody understand what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Your price is uh, down here, your MC is up here. So this is where price is less than MC. Mm. That means your marginal cost is greater than price. And when you get to that point, that is a hinge to you that it is time to cut down the level of production until you get all the way to where it is. P equals to MC, which is when you produce it exactly 500 units. Yes, question? Um, don't wages count into the uh, MC? Yes, it does. So Good I mean, question. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it does, because that's uh, basically your, uh, but it is not, uh, it is your variable cost, yes, yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you calculate your marginal cost, you basically look at your difference between the total cost, remember. And your total cost has two types of costs, right? Fixed and variable. So the labor cost goes into the variable part. You still have the fixed part you have to take care of, right? Very good question. I like that question. Thank you for asking it. Okay, so you, you would choose the profit maximizing output where P equals MC. This is very important. 
If you get nothing out of today's class, be sure you get that. Because the MC. So that's why I put 10 stars here. And this is true for all types of cook, uh, competition, but in this case, because we already know that your margin of revenue is the same as your price, so therefore, P is an MC. Okay, what's the law of supply? Say, uh, perfectly competitive firm supply could be its marginal cost. We talk about it earlier. For every price quantity P along the market supply could price would be equal to each seller's marginal cost of production. So that every point along the market supply could price measure what it should or it would cost producer to expand production of one unit. That just basically define the meaning of a marginal, what is marginal cost. So all you need to know really is uh, that this is your supply curve. I'll go ahead and put it down here like that, okay? So like supply curve, demand curve cut, so there, there's your equilibrium. And not more than just an equilibrium. We actually have a special name for it that is the profit maximizing quantity. Someday when you graduate with UNCP business degree, some of you, you want to pay attention to that. Although this is considered a benchmark market. So eventually, this is important. Regardless of what market structure you eat, monopoly, monopolistic, all that. So remember all the features we talked about. Okay, so next, uh, what are some of the determinants of supply curve? Well, that's kind of like going back to your chapter three. You know, we say technology, if you remember that example we did in the class, well, not in the class, like your homework example. So if there is a rotation crop technique that's uh, more improved, then yeah. You tend to produce more because uh, more productive technology brings about better production. So farmers are rejoicing. They say, yeah, we produce more input prices. If this goes up, that was the same question that we look at your variable cost goes up, your supply goes up. Right. Because then it, it costs more for you to produce than you supply could shift to the left. Why are we calling it a shift? Because, because it's a change of other prices, other than its own price. What is its own price? Its own price is the price of barter, $35 per hundred, or $45 per hundred, according to the example we look at. And number of suppliers, yeah, the more suppliers, the yeah, supply could shift to the right. If you are shocked, you know, you suppress them, you say, yeah, I take over everything. Mergers and acquisition, then you're the only one in the industry. Then, of course, you get everything, you know, the winners takes all. Then a uh, number of suppliers, would, they die out, they ship to the left. Expectation, uh, we don't talk about that that much, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to skip that. Changes in prices for other products are there as well. Okay, next, oh, come back to this e scary equation. Uh, you can't know this equation for your test. Well, I'll give it to you if you ask, but then you have to understand what it means, how to apply it, right? Okay, so now we apply it to the supply curve instead of demand curve. We call this price elasticity of supply. Very good. See, now this is S. Well, it's the price elasticity anyway. So on top you have change in quantity divided by percentage change in quantity divided by percentage change in price. So this is talking about the same thing. How reactive it is to the price change, the change in supply. So for example, in last week's, uh, the other day example, we say we may increase the price from $35 per hundred dollar to $45 per hundred dollar. Now we know right away, if that's going to happen, uh, there's incentive for you to produce more if you increase the price. So you tend to want to produce more. The supply curve will move along the supply curve because it's, it's not a shift because it's talking about its own price change. But the other thing is, the next question, how much change, how much increase is it? Is it greater than one, which we call it elastic? Or is it less than one, which we call inelastic, or is it exactly equals to one, which we'll call it what? 
You need elastic. You need, yes. Perfect elastic is when you have horizontal line. Yes. Perfectly elastic. Now, if you have a vertical land, uh, line that stands up like a lamppost, mm -hmm. straight, that's your perfectly inelastic because you're at the mercy of price increase. Well, you know, like businessmen traveling on a business trip. Mm -hmm. So they get noticed, you know, from Chicago or New York. They say, oh, you know, hello, somebody got to represent uh, your, your brand, you know, we have a meeting next week. That's a very short notice. That means you have to quickly book your flight, everything. Sometimes uh, uh, the, sh the notice might be within a day or two. And if that's the case, you know, you are expecting to pay a very high price, right? Oh, well, then it's okay. Company pays for it. So they say no sweat. So they're at the mercy of price. So you see that they have more inelastic demand. If you're a leisure traveler, Thanksgiving, Christmas, that sort of thing, you know. If you look at the price goes up, you know, double, you say, oh, you chicken out right away. Say, I'm going to drive. I'm going to take Amtrak <laughs> or whatever, you know, great home. And because, you know, you're more elastic. You're more sensitive to price change. You react, uh, say, wow, Amtrak, here I come. But, you know, businessmen are not like I say, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pay 2000 so be it. I got to be in Chicago tomorrow for that board meeting. OK, so that kind of like gives you the meaning of elasticity, well, how reactive. Okay, So the same thing here. Um, you notice that here you didn't have that P naught, Q naught, and this is actually your P naught, Q naught. That should be your Q naught and P naught. If you have two sets of prices, two sets of quantity. That P and Q will represent your original price and quantity before the change is happened or imposed. Okay, so again, that's what it is, and the same one. So let's look at one example. In this example, we want to calculate the example of price elasticity or something. And before I show you other thing, I want you to pay a very special attention. This is a good time to wake up. Uh, look at that supply curve. You say, what is that to look at? Is it straight? Is that what's sloping? Yes. But have you noticed one other thing? The supply curve goes to the, what do we call that? Origin. The origin, zero, zero. That's very crucial. Remember that. Because later on, we look at one more example where it doesn't go to the origin, and then your price elasticity or supply will be all different. Okay, so very good. So let's look at point A. Very easy. What is your price? Uh, let me write that equation down for you. So we could apply it here. Okay, so right here, uh, P over Q, 1 over slope. So I expect you to already remember, sort of, I, although I could review that uh, in passing, about that slope, because I think most of you uh, remember that. So you see, it really pays to review the chapter once I cover it. If you wait, accumulate it, you haven't mastered that first one, and now you're like trying to study it, it's a lot harder. So, uh, okay, here it is. So I wrote it down here for you. So let's see how we got there. Let's do this first one first. So right here, A is uh, a point A. So where is the price, where is the quantity? The price is $4, the quantity 12. So that's how we have the, everybody see that? This will be four, this will be 12. Now one of the slope, well let me review that quickly. What is a slope? Slope is typically you calculate it, your high school math, the vertical axis um, is on top, and your horizontal axis is at the bottom. So in this case, that will be 12 and 4. Vertical axis is 4. This is 12. Everybody got that? So. One over slope, or what we call reciprocal of the slope, would be you reverse it because that would be one divided by one like that. So that basically that, which is three. 
this is one of those, if you simplify it. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means this should be what? Three. So that should be three, yes. This is a four, so the answer is one. Everybody okay with that? Any questions about that algebra? Oh, some of you look stunned. Okay, go ahead, ask me a question. Kiara, are you okay? You understand that? Okay. I'm watching your face to see which one look positive. Okay, nobody. Very good. So that means the price elasticity is one. How easy. Let's look at one other point higher. How about point B? Now, point B here, the price is now five, the quantity is now 15, so we plug it in. What about the slope? You expect the slope to be the same. Why? Because it's on the same line. But nevertheless, if you want to go ahead and calculate, you could say, oh yeah, the slope would be uh, all the way up here, phi, all the way to this point here, because they're looking at point B, so 15. So 15, again, that would be 5 divided by 15. And then if you flip it around, that would be basically. And that's still the same. And that's uh, still the same. Even though the number has changed here. Oh, 5 divided by 15. 15 divided by 5, which is 3. So then that should be the same. This should be the three here, but then this number will be different now because that will be five and 15, which basically is one third. So again, one third time, your one over slope is three. So then you have one. Everybody okay with that? I'm doing it very slowly for your sake. So now you could derive uh, something out of this. You say, Okay, listen up. If the supply curve goes through the origin, that is directly price elasticity of supply is one. So it doesn't matter which one you look at. Da 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 da. They're all one. Next, let's look at the next example. Now this is not so. Now look at this. What have you noticed right away? What? Yeah, it does not start from the origin. Very good. It starts at 4. So pay attention to that. Don't say I didn't tell you. So now let's do a calculation here. We're going to again calculate the price elasticity of supply at point A. At point A, we say the price is 8 and the quantity is 2. What about the slope? Be careful here. The slope will be, now you can't really see it here. Oh well, yeah, we could. The slope will be, everybody could see my finger if you draw a line here all the way here mm -hmm. and drop it down like that. So it will be like a triangle here. Mm -hmm. So your slope will be the vertical axis, which is okay. 8 minus 4, which is 4. What about your horizontal axis? From here to here it is? Dude, very good. That should be kind of like straightforward there. So then this should be two. Okay? What about this? Isn't it uh, straightforward? So it will be half, right? Because the reciprocal of two is one half. Okay. So I hope it's obvious to you. If not, please interrupt me and ask. Okay, so right there you have half there now. Then we know the other number is you have to look at the price and quantity. P is 8, this is 2. So 8 divided by 2, which is 4, 4, half of 4 it is 2. Very good. So this is not 8. Okay. Everybody see that? And that's because now you have to do it like that. I could easily draw a line here and then you see that the slope should be way the Axis. And vertical axis is not 8 anymore, yo, because it's 8 minus 4. Got it? So pay attention to that. The next one, what about point B? 
Uh, point B, okay, 10 divided by 3, that's your price, that's your quantity. How do we get half? Now, what we do here is uh, we look at this green line. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. So the vertical axis will be 10 minus 8, which is 2. Okay, and the horizontal axis will be 3 minus 2, which is 1. So 2 divided by 1 is 2. The reciprocal of 2 is 1 half. Very good. That's how we got that. So as you can see, the slope is the same, one half, one half, that we expect it to be so. Only thing different is that quantity and price, uh, where the point is. And of course, you have to pay attention to be sure you calculate your vertical axis correctly. So what did we learn from here? From point A to B, tell me what happened in terms of that value. Did it go up or down? Oh, some of you don't know the answer because you confused this fraction or complex number. This is, come on, what should I put here? Two. Very good. It's one and two third. Okay, so uh, is two greater than one and two third? Oh, yes. Yeah. So what that's saying is that as you move from point A to B, your price elasticity of supply will decrease from two to one, one and two third. And then what the title say? Somebody read the title. What does it say? A supply curve for which price elasticity declines. Declines means drops, decreases, lower, reduced as quantity rises. So as you produce more and more, that means as you move towards this direction and that will keep moving up and that price elasticity or supply is going to go down. So you got it, I did it so slow. I think you should get it. Okay, next up, we go for that perfect thing. So this is your perfectly price elasticity or supply. It looks like a lamppost standing up, what does it mean? And now this is applying to the supply side now, not the demand side. The demand side, I talked about this uh, business travelers, air travelers. Now this is the supply side and we gave an uh, example of the price of land in, uh, within the, uh, the limits of Manhattan. Manhattan, excuse me. What do you think? Do you think the price of, uh, in the Manhattan area, is it expensive or cheap? Expect it to be expensive, yes. And the reason it is expensive because they don't have enough land. It is very crowded. I mentioned to you that, you know, the apartment, uh, the bed, it's, you have to pull up the bed and hide it in the wall so you got space. So nighttime, you pull it down, you know, it makes a, a bed. That's your bedroom, that's your kitchen, and that's your living room, everything. You could fool people and say, oh, look at my... Yeah, look at my living room, isn't that cute, you know? Why don't you go out for a second? And <laughs> shut the door and pull your back down. Come on in now, here's my bedroom, isn't that sweet, you know? And <laughs> hey, you're not gonna fool anybody. They know the difference. So that's the space you got. That's how much you have. So, okay, so what this is saying is price elasticity is zero because, you know, you don't have control over the price. So no matter how much the price goes up or down, that's the fixed amount of land you got. Manhattan. How many square, well, thousands of acres, yeah. I was going to say square footage, but no. <laughs> that's too little. You can't even use that. So use the term uh, thousands of acres. That's what it is. Limited supply. You got the fixed plots of land and uh, price goes up and down. I guess uh, I mentioned the country of Singapore, didn't I? Oh no, this is the other class, yeah, where you could reclaim the land because the country is an island country. You don't have much land, so they keep building the houses upward, vertically. So you don't have a lot of land houses. Like here in North Carolina, you could drive and then you look at this house, you know, well, we say it's pretty and it's got two stories and it's got acres and acres of land. Not in Singapore. If you see a landed property, 
it costs about three minutes. And the space is so little. So everybody can, well, the common people, most people, majority, 80% of the people live on high rise. That you got a nice apartment built all the way up. I once looked at, when I lived there, I once looked at the apartment, very nice, you know. <laughs> 200,000 <000 laughs> per unit. And it's hardly have any space. And then I came to North Carolina, I picked a house, 200,000. I've got lots of space, 13 acres of land. Mm -hmm. I say, whoa, wow. Well, when you don't have enough land, that's what happens. It's expensive. OK, next, uh, look at this. This is perfectly priced elasticity of supply. So we call this going to infinity. Because uh, what is a good example here we want to look at? It look at the supply of lemonade. How many of you have made lemonade before? Okay, most of you have. What are some of the ingredients you need? Tell me. Sugar. You get sugar? Okay, what else? Lemons. Lemons. Water. Water, yes. Sugar. On a hot summer day, you want it. You want ice. How are you going to serve people? Not with hands. Like, <coughs> you can. You got to have cups. You got to have a pitcher, right? To set up a booth, you gotta have all that. Paper cups, a pitcher, a number of them. So you can pour, you can mix. Hey, a three year, a five years old kid could do that. Not difficult. The, the resources are quite mobile. It's up to you. Even if you did it wrong, nobody discovered it. You say, well, it's just uh, natural. You know, it's too sweet, it's fine. If you put too much sugar in it, they won't complain. They think this is the way it is. Well, some people will complain, but. <laughs> Anyway, so here are some of the determinants of supply curve, elasticity. Remember, we look at it on the demand side. We say on the demand side, we have three factors. Anybody remember? Time is one of them. The other one is the budget sheet. Remember, I used the term, it's the big ticket item. Or it's just like more than stock. It doesn't matter, you know, if the price goes up, you know, people just need to buy it. What was the other one? The degree of substitutability. If the price of SUV goes up, you look for something else. By 10%, let's just say. Okay, so let's look at the supply side determinant. And one of them is uh, the more easily additional unit or input can be acquired, the higher the price elasticity. elasticity. So in the case of lemonade, we say uh, the inputs are very flexible. You got water, you got lemons, you got uh, sugar, and you got this uh, ice, you know. And, and up to you to mix, you know. If you want it too sweet, a little bit more sweet, you want it less sweet, or less water, more lemon, more sugar, or more water, less lemon, less uh, sugar. So be it. A kid can do that. Mobility or inputs, uh, how mobile is your input? You know, your textbook gave a very interesting example. It looks at, uh, looks at the circus performance. How many of you have been to, the, in October, in this county, we have something called uh, County Fair? How many have you been to it? Oh, None of you? Like a county fair? Oh, in October, they have it? So what, what, what do you do when you go to that? You buy stuff. You buy cotton candy? You play a game, okay, and you might, well, some cows might win some blue ribbons, right? And sometimes they have a roller coaster, right? I think they have some of this. And the roller coaster is not like state of the art, you know? It's not like the Batman upside down, that kind of, you know, tornadoes, uh, uh, flying eagles. Do you still have those? Flying eagles? I can't remember, it's been so long. Like I told my class, I have a book about roller coaster because I used to want to hit all of them. Can't do it now, you know. Not at my age. But anyway, uh, I have to go see chiropractor the next day if I can if I go. Anyway, I all accounts are kinds of sports now, not that kind of entertainment anymore. Uh, so so I'm trying to get back to this here. Now have you noticed that this people who uh, we set up this county phase, and they are the same people that they move from one county to another. You know, the next month they're in Cumberland County. If you go to it, say, oh, same people, same kind of stunts, you know, everything. And, and it's very easily set up to 10 
like for a week and then you fold it up uh, or a month and then you leave leave town or you move on to the next county. Circus is kind of like that. Have you ever heard people say, you know, that's a good place for the ex-convict to work because the police never trace them because they keep moving around, you know. And then the next time you come around, like, whoops, they're gone. You know, you can't find them. You don't know where they're gone. So I guess that means mobility or inputs means the people you hire and how you could close shop one day or you could set it up easily. Ability to produce substitute inputs or uh, synthetic rubber. Now, synthetic rubber versus natural rubber. The countries of Malaysia, where I'm originally from, and Brazil are the big producers of natural rubber. Now, United States is number one world producers of synthetic rubber. They, you know, I mean, like, how many of you been to the doctor's office and, uh, you know, they use this rubber glove, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the questions they ask you is, like, are you allergic to latex? What is latex? L-A-T-E-X. This is a natural rubber. Some people are allergic to it. Now, how many of you use a uh, bandage a lot? I bet most of you do, if you get into sports and all that. There's a kind of bandages that's uh, pure latex. That, you know, a lot of people are allergic to it. Well, I wouldn't say a lot. Some people are allergic to it. So when you put it on, it's very nice, you know. Uh, but when you tear it off, you look at it, whoa, why am I getting all those rashes, you know? So they ask you questions that they are you allergic to latex sometime. So if you're not sure, you better say no, because it uses, uh, well, there are some that are make of synthetic, they're not as good. The, the, the natural rubber one, they are very sticky. You could tell. Anyway, so they try to be cheap, you know, use a synthetic rubber, which is, uh, Never mind about that, yeah. So anyway, uh, that's the, if you have a lot of substitutes, right, you, uh, your price elasticity of supply goes up. So likewise with time, the longer is the time price elasticity of supply goes up. Then the last one is very interesting. We look at the unique essential inputs of talents. Uh, you see, I didn't know these people are going to be like, I use this example for <laughs> the last 10 years. I didn't know something was going to went wrong with this Lance Armstrong or Tiger Woods. So maybe I should change the name. Mm -hmm. or Ma Magic Johnson is OK. Or Michael Jordan, OK? Mm -hmm. And what's so special about those people? They got some kind of unique talent. Let's go back to it. So the uh, elasticity of supply looks like that. There's only one Magic Johnson in the world. So there he is right here. And the prize. What's the price? So when you're famous, what happens? Nike will come to you, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Michael Jordan, who will come to him? Nike mm -hmm. and some other big uh, sneakers company, you know, and once it's named like, okay, how about Jordan A? So I, I saw them giving peers away to people, you know, and watch their reaction, free. They're doing like a survey. I saw it on, I don't have TV at home, but when I work out in the gym, I happened to see that for whatever, 30 minutes. I was exposed to that little much of TV. I saw them giving out this Jordan Air to homeless people. Oh, and then watch a reaction. You know, what size do you want? 13, we got it. Here it is. And they say, oh yeah, brother, that is so kind of you. How could you other? They don't just give it to the homeless. They, they were doing a survey like how people react to receive to Jordan, you know, receiving Jordan. Yeah, it's like a marketing survey. I'm sure it's done by Nike because they could afford to have it. Who makes uh, Jordan? Uh, Nike. Nike? Okay. So anyway, so this is what it is saying. You have all the endorsement of all this sports, uh, well, not sports, like the sportswear company, you know, they will pay you so high and it could it could go up to up and down the price, but your talent is fixed if you're Magic Johnson, if you have that unique essential input. Or it could be someone who is uh, a very good, world-renowned uh, chef. And then all the big hotel in Chicago, Chicago five-star hotel will want to grab you. So they will keep increase the salaries and say, well, what about 100,000 a year? <laughs> and so that's what it is, the price elasticity of supply for 
people who have unique and essential inputs here refer to talent. Okay, so you have that straight line, lamppost, uh, elasticity of supply. Because uh, talents is uh, supply of labor, right? If you think about it. Now, we got two other diagrams I want to show you. Number one, we want to look at two examples. One is a gas industry. The second one is a car industry. And we want to illustrate using price elasticity or supply and demand curve. And let you see the difference. Now, what do you think is the demand for price elasticity or demand for gasoline? I think I asked you that question the other day. So if the price of gas goes up, say, what is it now, $2.20 somewhere there? If let's say if, if it goes up to 250, that's not too bad. You would still come to school, right? I hope. Yeah, and if it goes up to three dollars, would you? Yeah. You mean oh, wow, so fast <laughs> already? <laughs> some of you are very price elastic. Okay, so I'm getting some reaction already. And some of you say, eh, I still have to drive. You know, maybe I will consolidate my trip. Have you heard about that expression? Consolidate my trip. You come? No, you never heard about it. I always tell my husband, and I do that. I practice that all the time. When you go to town, you do ten things. You save trips. Well, of course you can't always do ten things, but maybe three or five. When you go to Pembroke, do your grocery day. Well, some of you say, "Oh, I don't think so." Okay, never mind. That's uh, anyway, so in other words, most people are very price inelastic when it comes to demand for gas, correct? Mm -hmm. Unless it goes up to like $5 per gallon, then you might want to invest in a motorcycle, mm -hmm. public transportation. They don't come to Pembroke, mm -hmm. it's just too bad, depending on where you are. Everybody is so spread out, you need your four wheels. Okay, so in other words, demand for gas, gasoline usually is considered inelastic. That means you're at the mercy of price. You still will come to school. You still will go to market. You still will do this and that. I mean, you might consolidate your trips, like I said. Gasoline market has large and more frequent supply share. That is true. Why? It used to be in the 70s, we are at the mercy of the Middle East political situation, right? So every time there is a change in political uh, situation, like in the uh, the first oil shock in the early 70s and late 70s, where you have the two famous uh, oil shock, basically you're at the mercy of the market. Well, U.S. rely on the Middle Eastern gas market very much back then, but now less, you know, because you learn from that painful experience. So here's your demand curve. Does it look inelastic to you? Yes. Yes or no? Now, how, how do you know if it is inelastic? The, the extreme case is it stand up like a lamppost, straight line. So this one is considered very steep. Can you cycle up? Yeah. Well, no, I should say that. This is very difficult. It's very steep. Yeah. Nobody could do that. Yeah. You could use a rope. Yeah. Climbing. Climb. <laughs> Upsailing. How many of you heard about FCL? <laughs> okay, so there it is. Demand curve is very inelastic. Supply curve, likewise, very inelastic. And we're going to shift the supply curve to the left. Next. So as it turns out, you could see that the price will go up a lot by big percentage, actually. You could calculate if you want, because then you take the difference between this two number divided by 1.02. I can see probably about 60% increase there. So right here, you can see that when you increase from here to here, when the supply curve shift to the left, the price has gone up substantially. Uh, yeah, and then, but look at this. It didn't decrease by very much. Well, I mean, you could calculate that. You will see that it's considered inelastic because that means the price reacts a lot more Remember this change in uh, prices in the denominator, this is changing quantity. 
this will react like about more than 1%, this will be like less than 1%. So then you end up having a fraction which is less than 1. That's what happened. Now, next, uh, let's compare to cars. What do you think? So at the beginning, you have this demand curve. Somebody describe this demand curve to me. Uh, elastic. Okay, very good, elastic. How do you know it's elastic? Because it's not steep. It's not as steep, very good. That's a good way to be very comfortable with it and say, I may be able to cycle uphill. Because it's what we call a gentle, uh, a gentle slope. Okay, that's what we say. Although the most gentle one will be if it's a flat line, right? Horizontal line, then no problem. Anybody could cycle on a flat line. Sometimes it's downhill, but we're not going to get into that because downhill means you slide down. You don't have to use any, anything at all. Because, you know, if you cycle uphill, if there's an uphill, there's a downhill. It tends to be like that. Okay, so that's the demand curve for car industry now. And the first thing you notice is that it's elastic. Next, we're going to throw in a supply curve. Supply curve also was not as steep as what you saw earlier. Mm -hmm. So that's the original price for a car, 16400 Don't know what kind of car it is. Maybe it's a Kia. Okay, this uh, 12,000 uh, units of car. And then we're going to increase the supply. Well, actually decrease the supply. So supply could shift up. That is the supply of car, okay. And let's look at it now. This goes up by about $600, okay, right there. And this goes down by about 1,000. So if you calculate it, this turns out to be more elastic because you see uh, one out of 1,000 out of 11, Thousand, so that will be roughly about 10%, actually, uh, maybe a little bit less. And this will be like, if you calculate that, that would be a small number. This would be a big number. So if you have a big number up here, greater than one, this is less than one, then you have a more elastic uh, price elasticity of supply and demand in this case. So that's just an example to tell you that. So for this chapter, this last two chapters here, you have to know price elasticity or demand and supply back and forth. And then very importantly that the, what was the other one we talked about, perfect competition. Let me ask you again. What is the price maximizing uh, quantity? What is the criterion? Uh, MB equals MC. Okay, be more specific in the case of perfect competition. You're right, but if you apply it to perfect competition, it should be P equals to MC because your marginal revenue is your price. So remember P equals MC. Okay? So, uh, producer surplus, anybody remember that definition I gave you? No. Is it area? What is it? Under? Producer surplus. Let me ask you very quickly which one is it? The student get to tend to get confused. Okay, we call A, this is B. Which is it? A or B? There you go, look very confused. It's B. A is consumer surplus, B is business surplus. Anybody remember the definition? Is the area below the price line and above the what? Very good, supply curve. So you asked to calculate that area of that triangle, which we did not very long ago. So this is amount by which price exceed the seller's reservation price. So if you look at the example, you have seen that example before, and we calculated that before using half price times quantity, half base, half base times high. So what this is saying is that the first unit, the seller is willing to sell as low as maybe about 50 cents, eh? But then consumers are willing to pay $2. So is that good for the seller? Yes, absolutely. So the first unit, he gains a lot of consumer surplus. And then as she sell more and more units, 
is less and less willing to, his reservation price rises. So then it becomes less and less. It's kind of like the opposite of this Michael Jackson concept example. So until all the way there. So in other words, the area of triangle is your producer surplus. And again, you use half base times high. Quick review. Base is uh, 4,000. We've done this last time. This is just a quick review. And your height will be 2 minus 0. So then you get 4,000. Now, be careful. Your height should not be 3. Because 3 is that whole triangle. Because that whole triangle has two parts to it. This is your producer surplus. And the one up there is your consumer surplus. Anybody remember that definition? It's the area of the triangle below the demand curve and above the price line. Now remember that because in the next uh, chapter, next two chapters, this definition I just gave you will save, you, save your life. Okay, very good. Uh, we still have a little bit of time, so if you show me your notes today, I'll give you extra credit for taking it. I'll add one point. Don't start taking notes now, it's too late. Yeah, so come on now. Let's go.